So, this takes care of the CMOS design style. By the way, I noticed that in many universities, a lot of time is being spent on NMOS, ED, enhancement, enhancement and so on. These design styles used to be important when we were learning VLSI design, but now NMOS technology is hardly used. So, therefore, I have a feeling that both at a curriculum level, if you have, if you are part of the curriculum committees and so on, the emphasis on pure N channels should be reduced and CMOS design should be taught much more. Almost exclusively, most designs these days are done in CMOS. Okay? So, in your paper setting, in your time that you spent, etc., if you spend more time on CMOS, then your students will be able to meet the requirements of the industry much better because once they are in the, in the industry, they will practically never design pure end channel. Okay. Is this the only way to design logic? And the answer is no. There are other logic designs and we shall in the next half hour quickly go over other logic styles and see when are those logic styles important. First of all, since you have done a lot of NMOS, the idea is that this is the CMOS summary, right? That logic consumes no static power. That is the main important point. But suppose I do not care. Can I make my design simpler by doing pseudo NMOS? Okay? All of you have taught NMOS, ED, inverters, etc. Okay? So, what, what happens? You have a depletion device which is always on. But in CMOS, there is no depletion device. So, what am I going to do? So, the answer is that take the PMOS and connect its gate to ground. It will be always on. So, instead of depletion device, you use a PMOS whose gate is always connected to ground. Okay? So, this is equivalent to your NMOS design. Therefore, it is called pseudo NMOS. So, the question is why should I do it? If I have a CMOS technology with N channel and P channel transistors both available, then why should I hobble myself like this and design things like this? Well, there are times when this is important. This is advantageous. What are those times? Notice that the advantage of this is that each output drives only one transistor. Okay, in case of CMOS, every output goes to an N channel transistor as well as to a P channel transistor. That means the capacitive load is high on every output. Okay? Here the capacitive load is low. Remember that the interconnect is also more complicated because the P channel devices are in a separate well. They are far away from the N channel device. So, the same signal has to go to this well as well as to that well. Therefore, the loading capacitance is high because of that reason as well. Whereas here, it is short and sweet. Go from the drain of one end channel, it goes to the gate of the next end channel. And the P channel could be remote, could be connected somewhere. Right? So, as a result, this, this design reduces capacitance. And when is that advantageous? When you have very fast circuitry, where most of the power is not static, but it is dynamic. So, C B squared F. Right? So, therefore, pseudo NMOS could be important in those cases where you want to design some very small part which works all the time is very fast. Now, I will not drag you through this, but similar to the CMOS design, there are all these regimes for etc. etc. And uh, there is the corresponding algebra, which we will take as red right now. Okay? This is a one semester course and we are finishing it in uh, two hours. So, uh, we cannot do everything in the class here. But all this material is available to you. Uh, sir, one doubt, sir. Uh, in that NMOS, but uh, there will be static power dissipation. There will be static power dissipation. So, it depends on which power dominates. And therefore, that is attractive only if the noise never remains static. So, if you have, suppose, some computation being done every clock cycle and some very, very fast clock, then you may find that CMOS, while it saves static power, but it is never static. On the other hand, it consumes a lot of dynamic power because of the large capacitance. And in, the, in such cases, this might be a better choice. There is actually one other application where CMOS won't do at all, and that is the PLA design, programmable logical lo logic array design. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have perhaps included it here, but that is because of the configuration uh, that CMOS cannot do it at all. Okay. One important point is that we have we notice that the beta must be greater than this number. Okay. This is the, what is beta? Beta is the ratio of the N channel to the P channel transistor in this case. The NMOS, CMOS never put this restriction. CMOS simply said that VDD should be greater than VTN plus VTP. That is all. 
otherwise the solutions came out but here the solution won't come out real or nicely unless beta is greater than this that means that this is ratioed logic that is because the upper transistor is all the time dumping current this guy is all the time dumping current unless the lower transistor is much bigger than the upper transistor it won't be able to pull it down to ground because after all this is a potential divider and the upper guy is always on so when this is on it should be so much stronger than the upper one that it pulls the output voltage all the way down and that will be true only if the ratio is correct so this kind of logic is called ratioed logic it works like digital logic only if the ratio of the p channel and n channel is assured above some value okay that comes out actually from that algebra okay and similar to that you can now do rise time fall time uh, speed etc etc i am just going to um, skip over all of this but this is done in painful detail here so in classes of course you will be taking many classes and deriving all these uh, equations and the conversion to other logic is simpler you follow the same rule for nmos but there is only one pmos transistor which is always grounded so that you leave untouched the other things are converted to this and here is a here is an example of that same expression so this is a dot b plus c dot d plus c e. okay so for every dot series a dot b for every plus parallel plus c dot d plus e okay so you can uh, implement fairly complicated logic in a single stage okay now let's look at uh, complementary pass gate logic you would have done it in the digital part where often there is this favorite question how can you use a multiplexer as a logic element okay and that depends on this shannon's theorem what it says is that if you have a logical function which is a function of x1 x2 through xn of boolean variables then it can be expressed as two simpler functions this is the function when x1 is 1 therefore x1 dot and this is the function when x1 is 0 so it's like a multiplexer where xi is being used as a multiplexer if xi is 1 it selects this function if xi is 0 it selects this function okay and now f1 and f2 can be further simplified by the same logic so this is the multiplexer logic and this multiplexer logic finds a physical interpret physical implementation in this logic called the complementary pass gate logic so to implement a multiplexer you need both xi and xi bar so therefore complementary this is the uh, hallmark of complementary logic that you need both um, true and complement signal and you provide both true and complement signal as a result okay so the only difference is that now there are two wires for every logical level you must take that into account now this is the basic multiplex multiplexer structure okay look at this what happens when xi is 1 okay when xi is 1 these switches are on and these are off right xi bar these are n channel transistors now we need to put an inverter here otherwise there will be a vt drop across this n channel transistor and the output logic level will not be good so you need to put a buffer to restore the logic okay so that is what we do this is f1 bar it passes through and you get f here okay so this is f1 bar f2 bar f1 f2 and pass it through inverters and you get f and f bar okay now why do we bother with this new uh, structure this has a beautiful property what is that beautiful property first of all look at the layout of this whatever be your logic the layout will look like this okay so you can have a standard layout and like a stamp just go stamping it and each logic will have exactly the same shape and size okay this is a great advantage in making compact circuits 
the other parties look at the delay it doesn't matter what logic you are implementing you have one switch delay and one inverter delay whatever be the logic okay so it doesn't depend on the level of the signal and it doesn't depend on the kind of logic and xor has the same delay as a nand okay the other thing is that now the type of logic required is much less because the same logic will produce and as well as nand okay so you don't want separately inverting and non inverting logic okay so the overall variety of logic is smaller even within that variety the delay is very predictable okay and the delays are automatically matched that means the delay of this signal being zero this signal being one it doesn't go through series path here parallel path here etc etc rise time is not equal to fall time no such problems on the other hand for every signal two wires must run okay so that's a disadvantage that you have and you may pay some power penalty as it turns out it actually consumes generally consumes less power than cmos and this is a preferred logic at low speeds okay so that was too abstract let's look at some actual logic so consider the xor and xnor functions now all of you know what a pain it is to implement an xor okay so you have that famous four nand combination or four nor combination that you must have taught in the digital logic but here xor is no different from any other logic right so let's look at xor here there is an inverter right so the function here should be the xnor function here should be the xnor right what is xnor ab plus a bar b bar right so i get a and a bar here if a is 1 then i must pass b right if a is 1 you just put a equal to 1 here what do you get b right because this term is 0 you put a equal to 1 right so you get b so you bring b here now if you put a equal to 0 right that is when this switch will be selected because a bar will be 1 correct so put a equal to 0 what do you get this term becomes 0 and you get b bar right so you put b bar here. okay similarly this is eventually xnor this is an inverter therefore this must be an xor right so what expression do you want ab bar plus a bar b put a equal to 1 what do you get b bar right so a equal to 1 this is the switch and put b bar here put a equal to 0 what do you get b right so this is a switch which will be on if a is 0 and put b here right so it is as simple as just evaluating those sub expressions and this circuit has not changed at all what has changed is what gets connected to what right the circuit has remained the same so basically the difference between the normal the previous uh, logics and this one is like in the previous things each input becomes part of uh, the gate of each uh, uh, transistor here but uh, you are connected the two inputs to the same uh, uh, transistor one to the gate and one to the uh, drain or something like that correct but the important point here is that suppose this is the circuit now i want an and let's say okay so here is the and and look at the circuit the circuitry has not changed whereas in cmos if you go from and to or to xor series parallel the circuit will be different but here the circuit is the same only the input connections are different okay so you can implement any logic with the same basic circuit circuit is not going to change and that has great advantage uh, but you also made a statement sir that uh, this is used only for low speed applications uh, why can't you use it for high speed applications if you you know uh, uh, modify the, the physical properties of that uh, gate it can actually be used for high speed also in fact it is used for high speed also but then you consume more power because there are two interconnects per logic level so the capacitance doubles 
okay so your dynamic uh, power will be high in this case if you have very fast logic then both wires are continuously being charged and discharged so you pay the price for that okay so let's take the same combination and quickly go through and and logic right so this is a dot b therefore this must be nand a dot b whole bar put a equal to 1 what do you get okay you have to give me proof that you are all awake put a equal to 1 what do you get b bar right a dot b whole bar put a equal to 1 you get b bar right so a equal to 1 put b bar here put a equal to 0 what do you get you get 1 right but we want to connect only signals here we do not want to bring in the power supply ok so if you if you connect 1 and a is 0 you can connect a bar right so you bring a bar here similarly this is NAND therefore this must be an right so this is a dot b put a equal to 1 what do you get b so you connect b here put a equal to 0 what do you get 0 right so but a equal to 0 0 that means put a here right so that way your layout becomes simple your power supply lines do not come into the inputs and notice that these two outputs just go so they can just concatenate similarly this is or not notice that the circuit remains exactly the same there is no difference in the circuit and therefore delays remain exactly the same ok otherwise so this is of particular importance to arithmetic circuits because XOR occurs for almost all some calculations and for multipliers and so on. So XOR occurs unfortunately often and XOR is a very complicated gate in the standard thing A dot B bar plus B dot A bar cannot be minimized ok whereas here XOR is no, no more expensive than a NAND or a NOR ok. So you just put it through and you can make very compact arithmetic circuits here. So these are the plus points of this. Uh, pass gate logic. Now there is one problem here which we still have to solve. I have sold you this logic it has its attractive points but there is one point which is unattractive. What is that? Look at this particular circuit ok I have taken only half the circuit. Suppose this x is 1 ok that means just so that I am not talking in the air let us say this is 5 volts and this is also 5 volts and let us say all VTs are 1 volt ok. So, if this is 5 volts gate is at 5 volts and this is the source because this is at 5 volts this is lower. So, this is the source. So, this will start charging up and it can only reach 4 volts because as soon as it reaches 4 volts this transistor will turn off. So, it cannot charge it beyond 4 volts as a result the voltage here is only 4 volts in fact it is slightly lower than 4 volts because it will take infinite time to reach 4 volts. If this is below 4 volts then this PMOS cannot be turned off ok. So, there will be some even though this looks like a CMOS inverter there will be some leakage current here ok and that will consume static power. So, there is a trick for that what you say is that all right the leakage current is in the static when it has already reached 4 volts can't I use some circuit which will help it ok. So, what I do is that I take another PMOS here and feed it with the output ok. Now, let us see what happens this input was low first it is charging towards 4 volts right. Now, once it passes half the VDD or roughly the output will drop low right as the output drops low this other P PMOS will turn on ok and as it turns on it will quickly charge it up at 4 volts this guy will go off but because the output is already low this will take it all the way to 5 volts like CMOS problem solved everybody agrees what is happening? if the input is 5 volts this would have reached only 4 volts that would have left this PMOS partially on right 
but as the input reaches 4 volts the output would have gone down by that time. So, this low value turns this PMOS on which then takes it above 4 volts turning this PMOS off so that there is no leakage current. Okay? I want every neck nodding a lot. Okay? Have you solved the problem? We have not solved the problem. We have solved one problem and we have created another problem. Okay? What is that other problem? Suppose this guy is already at 1. Okay? Suppose this input is already at 1. Then this output is 0. That means this transistor is on. Now how do I take it to 0? If I want to take it to 0, that means this guy should be 0. Right? Now how does this circuit look? This transistor is on and this transistor is trying to take it to 0. This is at ground. So, does not it look like pseudo NMOS? This transistor is on and this transistor is grounded. Right? So, it is like a pseudo mass inverter. Therefore, it will work only if it is ratioed. Okay? Otherwise, this guy will not be able to take it down to 0 at all because this guy will happily source current. So, if this is turned on and if it gives you only a little bit of current, then that will not be enough to pull it down to 0. Once it pulls it down to 0, then everything is fine because once it pulls it down to 0, then the output goes high and then the PMOS turns off. Now no more problem. But this guy should be ratioed to be fat enough like a pseudo NMOS. That is why we studied pseudo NMOS before. So anyway sir, you are going for a, uh, for, for a ratioed uh, transistor configuration. No. So if that is the case, uh, why no, not? No, no, we are not going for ratioed in this otherwise. No, no, I mean in order to solve this problem, yeah. you are going for a ratioed transistor. Correct. So rather than going for that ratioed transistor, what if the you know the the external this uh, output uh, CMOS circuit. If you you know change the uh, characteristics of the transistor so that you can't pressure. change the VT. You can't change the VT. That is not in the designer's hand. That's in the hand of the technologist. And if you don't have a problem at one, then you'll have a problem at zero. Okay. Suppose you use a very high VT P channel transistor, then it will be a very slow circuit. It won't charge up properly. Okay. So, the reason why this problem came was that it is actually a latch. right? This is an inverter and this is driving another half inverter. right? So, it is a self perpetuating circuit and therefore, it is not easy to budge once it has reached 1 or 0. You must fight uh, to pull it down. Okay? So, that is what we do. So, therefore, this transistor must be much wider than this transistor. These two transistors must be much wider than this. And then it is okay. Then it does not consume any additional power. Okay? So, this is still a pretty good uh, circuit to use. Okay? So, this is what we are saying, this need for ratioing. Look at this circuit. It looks like this, right? So, this is a pseudo, pseudo NMOS inverter. This is the pass transistor which becomes the lower transistor and this is the pull up transistor. So, you must make this pull up transistor weak so that this guy can pull it down because its job is only to keep it at 1, it is only a keeper transistor. So, normally this is a long channel transistor. Okay? Now, that was one way, but suppose I want to improve the pseudo NMOS. Okay? So, let us try to find what is the problem with pseudo NMOS? Power consumption. power consumption. When does power get consumed? When is it that power is consumed? When the input is 1. So, the lower transistor is also on and the upper transistor is 1. So, I scratch my head and say, is not there some way that I can look at the output and turn the PMOS off when the lower switch is on? Okay? But then you will reach CMOS back. Okay? So, the point is I will not look at the input, I will look at the output. Right? So, what am I suggesting? Find me a way so that I can turn the PMOS off when it is being uncooperative and dumping power when I am trying to sink power. Right? So, give me, give me that logic which will do this. 
Okay, so let's look at this example. What do I have here? A nor, right? A and B in parallel, A plus B whole bar, right? So I have a nor here. So when can I drive this? Okay, static power is consumed when the output is low, right? Then the lower transistor is on, output is low. So when should I turn the upper transistor off? When for nor, right? Therefore, complementary of nor. That means when A or B is true, then we would like to turn the PMOS off, right? Because it is a nor. So when A or B is true, then the output will be low, right? So either A or B is true, then I must turn this PMOS off, right? So that is just a NAND circuit. If I, this is the standard CMOS, right? So I can make a NAND circuit, correct? If either A is off or B is off, then this output will go high and I will give this output to that. Right? Normally, I, I do not have unfortunately non-inverting gates. Right? When is the output low? This is NOR. When is the output low? NOR. Either is 1. Right? Then the output is low. So therefore, when do we want to turn the thing off? When either is low. Right? So we want to, when either A or B is true, right, then I want to turn this off, okay, so, sorry, nor, nor is low when OR is true, right, nor is low when OR is true. So I want A or B, but A or B cannot be generated, correct, because you have only inverting gates. So I can say A or B is nothing but NAND of A bar and B bar. Correct? So that is what I am doing. That alright, I will create, take A bar and B bar, take their NAND and drive the PMOS with this. You got the idea? What I am saying is that our problem is that when the output is supposed to be low, then this PMOS is unnecessarily wasting power by leaving the tap open when it should be closed. So can I not turn the tap off? So the answer is okay, what logic? so that it is turned off only when required. So the answer is that then you need the NAND of A bar and B bar. Okay? Unfortunately, then I have not solved the problem. Because if I need this, then this guy will consume the same amount of power that I will prevent here. Okay? So it is very easy to give up at this time that it, this idea will not work. But fortunately, I kick myself and say, look, what will prevent this current then? I do not give up easily. Okay? So when is this guy unnecessarily taking power? When both these transistors are on? That means both of them are 0. But that is this output. Right? So I can make this circuit and this circuit, both of them, and drive this PMOS by this, and this PMOS by this and now I have solved the problem. Okay? You got the construct? I will go quickly over this. Take this case. When is the output low? This is NOR. So either A or B is 1, then the output is low. In that condition, these transistors are trying to pull it low and this guy is unnecessarily dumping current. So we want to turn it off. Right? That condition is when A or B. Right? Because this is a NOR. It will be low when OR is true. So I want the OR. But OR I cannot generate without inversion. So I take the NAND of A bar B bar. Okay? So this is the NAND of A bar B bar. And I drive the PMOS using that. Now the problem came, came that this PMOS will be unnecessarily dumping power. So when is this dumping power? When both A and B are 0. Correct? Only when then both these transistors will be on. Right? When both A and B are 0, then this output will be low. That is when I am wasting power. But when both A and B are low, then this output is high. Nor. 
So rather than giving this to ground, I can give this output here. And rather than taking this PMOS to ground, I can give this output there. Okay? Now I have solved the problem. Neither gate uh, consumes power. Let us assume I have you know only two inputs A and B. I still need to generate the A bar and B bar, is not it? No, so this is a complementary logic. This is also a complementary logic. Okay? In fact, that is what I have done here. So, this is a this, this is called ca cascade voltage switch logic and this also needs both A and A bar. Okay? And it also provides A and A bar because this output and this output are complementary. Okay? So, it is just like the complementary switch logic except that it, uh, it is continuously driven and consumes no power. Okay? So, this is, a, this is called the cascade voltage switch logic. It has similarities to both pseudo and MOS in this. Like CPL, this logic requires both true and complement signals. It also provides both true and complement signals. This is called dual rail logic. Okay? Dual rail logic, by the way, has become important these days when the power supply voltage has been brought down and signal to noise ratio is important. So, therefore, since it is a differential mode, it works better. Like pseudo NMOS, the inputs present a single transistor load to the output. Right? You are not taking the output to both an NMOS and PMOS and the circuit is self-latching. Okay? It is in fact a latch. So, the circuit is self-latching. So, that is the advantage of this. Okay? We will stop here.